but we have, uh, Alejandro and I have had the great advantage of being able to think about the intellectual content and contact all of our wonderful speakers and bring them here. But the real work, as you all know, always gets done by the staffs of our two centers. So we, we just want to thank, and I don't think Jennifer is here, but when she comes, we'll way better. So we want to thank Rochelle Hammer and uh, Ian Allen and, uh, and Jennifer Hammer, who uh, have done such an excellent job of making these books And Cameron Mayo, who um, is an undergrad in his Am I doing the introduction? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was fun. Oh, I'm happy to do that. Okay. I'm bored. Yeah. 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 So, um, our final uh, panel, the last but not least, as we all like to say, um, is bringing in the humanities into this discussion in a very important way. So, um, I, we have a really all star panel, which we're very delighted to. Uh, present, um, many of you know uh, Professor Mikhail Kobialka, who is in the theater department here, um, and uh, he's the author of two books on Thais Contours Theater, and I think he's going to be discussing Contours Theater in, and, uh, in his presentation today. Um, uh, I, I knew Mikhail, Mikhail mainly as associate dean, um, a, a wonderful, attentive, and uh, supportive dean in, in terms of the, the kind of themes that we're working on here today and the interdisciplinarity that's so important to those things. So thank you, Mikhail, for being here. Um, let me go ahead and, and introduce also Rita Kampelmacher, who is a PhD student in the Department of Theater and Dance here at the University of Minnesota. And her research interests are at the intersection of migration studies and performance studies. And she's um, going to tell us about a very interesting case um, in, in Belarus. Um, and uh, our respondent today uh, is uh, our colleague and friend Jim Dawes, who joins us from McAllister College, where he's uh, recently a, a chair in the guys, the Reader's Digest guys. Uh, a chair. Reader's uh, Digest English Department chair. <laughs> That's it. In, um, Jim is an English professor, but his work um, is at the intersection of um, human rights representation, and uh, and and he uses texts of uh, in the field of human rights, uh, including perpetrators' confessions, um, as. Uh, as a basis for, for considering uh, uh, human rights and its ethical implications writ broadly. Um, we have uh, worked together on, on several occasions on the notion of first-person narration in human rights and, and uh, representing human rights in, in literary forms. Uh, uh, Jim's latest book, Evil Men, uh, has received a lot of um, international recognition um, dealing with the, um, the, the crimes of Nazi war criminals and, uh, not Nazi war criminals, um, Japanese war criminals and, um, uh, and, and how to engage with those as texts in an ethical way. So we're delighted to hear from this final panel and Mikhail, I think you were the first yes. Thank you, Barbara, for your, for your generous introduction, and thank you, Alejandro, for the invitation. Uh, it's good to know that representation that gets invited to be present, be part of this discussion. What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you a variant on understanding representation, specifically through the fine arts. Uh, this particular talk, which is about half an hour, is also an inaugural talk uh, about uh, Tadeusz Kantor's centennial. Uh, Kantor was born on April 6th, uh, 1915. And so I'm glad that uh, we can start this centennial here at the University of Minnesota. In the Euro-American tradition, the events of World War II cleaved the Western subject into irreconcilable fragments 
stigmatized forever by a memory of suffering. This memory of suffering detaches itself necessarily from history to function as a sociogenetic reminder of a, or a proxy for what happened in the past is happening now and could easily happen in the future. However, as the existence of concentration camps, or for this matter, recent political events in Europe, Middle East, and Africa made painfully obvious, human life can never remain outside of history. Neither can it escape being defined as a collateral damage of political activities, a condition that proclaimed that men and women are wanted intruders on creation as being destined to undergo unmerited, incomprehensible, arbitrary suffering and defeat. Let me ask, how can suffering find its voice without being assimilated by mnemotechnics? How can suffering find its voice without being appropriated by aesthetics and its regimes of representation? How can suffering find its voice so that the victim of suffering is not banished by its spectacle, dispensing us of a need to feel the kind of empathy that reminds us of our responsibilities? And in the case of this inquiry, how can suffering find its voice in art without immediately being betrayed by its conventions, culture, industry, uh, or neoliberal imaginary that defames the uncompromising radicalism of the artists? These questions have been haunt haunting us for quite some time. Consider, for example, an impassioned debate following the speech that Martin Walzer gave on October 11th, 1998, on being awarded the Peace Prize of the German book trade, in which he suggested that the memory of Auschwitz be consigned to the innermost conscience of the individual and be excluded from public discourse that instrumentalizes it for other purposes. The debate associated with the exhibition, The Memory of the Camps, staged in Paris in 2001, that focused on the ethics of presenting intolerable images, that is, four small photographs taken by a member of Sonderkommando showing a group of naked women being pushed towards the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Or the controversy elicited by Kevin Carter's 1993 photograph of a starving girl crawling on the ground on the brink of exhaustion while a vulture perches behind her awaiting its prey. Today, the traces of this debate, which is translated now into the debate about suffering as identity or about the construction of the victim as one of the, ele as one of the elements for grounded in a distribution of the visible in print, media, space, or on stage, can be found, for example, in Helena Graham's performance, Ethics and Spectatorship in a Global Age 2009, which draws on the philosophy of Emmanuel Lavinas to explore ethical questions she argues audience members face as spectators in a media-saturated landscape. In Nicholas's Redoubt's Theatre and Ethics 2009, which suggests that, quote, theater greatest ethical potential may be found precisely at the moment when theater abandons ethics. Or in Lynn Nottage's play, Ruined, which claims to portray the lives of Central Africans, and in particular, the lives of four women living in a brothel war zone in a small mining town in the Democratic Republic of Congo. I propose to address the questions I have posed earlier by elaborating on Theodor Adorno's notion of determinate negation articulated in his concept of an autonomous work of art. I wish to argue that the oft-quoted phrase, it's barbaric to write lyric poetry after Auschwitz, but suffering does not tolerate forgetting, has been emptied out of its generative and radical qualities by what is called today utopian performative. I would like to challenge the duplicity of the system that simultaneously solicits and declines the images of suffering and victimhood, that is the system which, on the one hand, calls for utopian performative that will produce the so-called autonomous zones of resistance and recuperation of the image or human dignity, and on the other hand, 
argues that since there is something unrepresentable, something that cannot be fixed in an image, the act of offering an equivalent, real or imaginary, produces the audience that becomes insensitive to the banalized reality of suffering. To substantiate these points, I will discuss Tadeusz Kantor's 1944 production of The Return of Odysseus, staged in Krakow when any artistic activity was punished with death by the Nazis. I will do so in order to reevaluate the notion of an autonomous work of art and introduce the notion of spatial dialectics expressing the tension between the structures of representation and historical materialism of objects art which are placed out there rather than in terms of the issues that arise in relation to the representation of the unspeakable or unrepresentable. I'm motivated by the kind of a move one finds in, for example, Jacques Rancière, who views the unpresentable as the central category of the ethical turn in aesthetics and political reflections. He discusses the current prevalence of the ethical turn in both politics and aesthetics by drawing attention to the depoliticized politics and the displacement of any sense of responsibility for an ethical one or of collective responsibility for individual accountability. Instead of a strong sense of justice, the form of political reordering or change and economic redistribution, the current neoliberal discourses cast their shadow backwards to a catastrophe while they define themselves against any fidelity to future justice. Quote, for a long time, well, for a long while, the decisive event was that of the revolution to come. With the ethical turn, this orientation is strictly inverted. History becomes ordered according to a cut in time made by a radical event that is no longer in front of us, but already behind us, end quote. Following Rancière's lead, Antonio Vasquez Arroyo adds, that this particular mode of thinking extends also to human rights discourse, which according to him, quote, is nourished by an account of the past, namely, the catastrophe is past, while the present, which is no longer catastrophic, is atoning for the past catastrophe and thus steadily resolute about preventing forms of political that threaten the neoliberal democratic capitalist status quo. Emancipatory projects are thus cast as threatening with a future recurrence of the catastrophic past, quote. Thus the problem for me is not whether the reality of the genocides can be put into images or performance. It is how it is and what kind of narrative is woven by a particular representational practice? What kind of empathy is prompted by the construction of a particular image? What kind of gaze and consideration are created by them? And what history is pushed into the background? The most common use of the intolerable images or committed drama places them along a linear trajectory from the intolerable spectacle to the awareness of the reality it expresses, to the desire to act in order to change it. But this link between representation, knowledge, and action, as history teaches us, is only a presupposition. Jacques Rancière averse in The Emancipated Spectator, quote, the intolerable image derived its power from the obviousness of theoretical scenarios making it possible to identify its content and from the strength of political movements that translated them into practice. The images of art mm -hmm. do not supply weapons for battles." End quote. In other words, within a predetermined reality, aesthetic convention or performative practice, freedom or fight for freedom becomes a vacant claim. As Adorno put it in his 1962 essay, Commitment, quote, 
It is not the office of art to spotlight alternatives, but to resist by its form alone the course of the world which permanently puts pistol to men's heads, end quote. At the same time, as he remarks, quote, there is something painful in Schenberg's compositions. The so-called artistic <laughs> representation of the sheer physical pain of people beaten to the ground by rifle butts contains, however, remotely the power to elicit enjoyment out of it. When genocide becomes part of cultural heritage in the themes of committed literature, it becomes easier to continue to play along with the culture which gave birth to murder." End quote. These statements, and especially the last sentence, may explain why Adorno, aware of the practice of using art as a kind of proxy allowing post-war generation not to approach a difficult history, perceived art not as a weapon in class struggle, as did the constructivist Bertolt Brecht or Erwin Piscator in the early decades of the 20th century, but as a mode of cognition. Adorno, for example, rejected any aesthetic potential of socialist realism or committed literature in societies which had thoroughly been integrated by the culture industry, a term Adorno coined. The culture industry, according to him, eliminated art which could be a trial arena for alternatives. What remained was fetishized art that protected society from social revolution and transformation. This is why Adorno called for the atomization of art, the atomization of representation, and the concomitant desubjectivization of artistic language. Quote, the principle that governs autonomous works of art is not the totality of their effects, but their own inherent structure. They are knowledge as non-conceptual objects. This is the source of their greatness. It is something of which they have to persuade men. It is not something they have to persuade men because it should be given to them." End quote. When expressed in art, autonomous works of art had to abandon the tradition which defined art in terms of representation affirming life. Adorno draws attention to the works of Arnold Schoenberg, Pablo Picasso, Franz Kafka, and Samuel Beckett that manifested forms which were freed from the strict laws of construction of mainstream representational art and were instead always changing and fluid, negating, decomposing, dissolving, deconstructing, or destroying any promise of representation. These works express the need to examine the current artistic forms that generate works where the distinction between being and the process of appearance is often obfuscated by the suppression of the ideology which causes that experience. That is, quote, where the to and fro of civil conversation replaces institutionalized violence and authoritarianism as well as irreconcilable conflict or promotes the to do it yourself approach in politics in order to inspire in the unfree individuals paralyzing their spontaneity the assurance that everything depends on them." End quote. Contemplation of the post-Auschwitz world, according to Adorno, needs to happen in a place where the works of art, by dismantling appearance, explode from, from form within the art. The uncompromising radicalism of these works refuses to play along with the culture that gave birth <laughs> to murder or with the realm where genocide has already become part of the heritage that archives and bears witness to a world avoiding the unresolved contradictions between protest and the discourse about commodity itself. Let me give you an example of an artistic practice that in my mind materializes Adorno's concept of the autonomous work of art. In lesson one of the Milano lessons, a Polish visual artist and theater practitioner, Tadeusz Kantor, noted, quote, 1944, Kraków, clandestine theater, 
the return of Odysseus from the siege of Stalingrad. Abstraction which existed in Poland until the outbreak of World War II disappeared in the period of mass genocide. This is a common phenomenon. Bestiality brought to the fore by the war was too alien to this pure idea. The anger of a human being trapped by other human beasts cursed art. We had only the strength to grab the nearest thing, the real object, and call it a work of art. Yet it was a poor object, unable to perform any function in life, an object about to be discarded, an object which was bereft of a life function that would save it, a cartwheel smeared with mud, a decayed wooden board, a scaffold spattered with plaster, a decrepit loudspeaker rending the air with screeching war announcement, a kitchen chair. The return of Odysseus could not be staged in a traditional theater, not only because Cantor perceived traditional theaters as mind deranging, but also, and more important, because such an act would be a betrayal <laughs> of his nonconformity in the face of the bestiality brought to the fore by the war. The anger of a human being trapped by other human beasts cursed art. Thus, the artistic creation, the act of grabbing the nearest thing, the real object, and calling it a work of art, took place in a space outside of the prevailing order of things, a Nazi occupation of in Krakow. This site was marked by the pressures of the state of emergency in which he lived and which defined the urgency of the struggle against fascism. The return of Odysseus was staged in a room which was destroyed by war. It was a useless room, a useless object which could no longer perform its function as inhabitable space assigned to it by a cultural norm, a convention, or an architectural design. Bereft of its use value, the room signified for Cantor the so-called reality of the lowest rank. It was, quote, antithetical to life, and that is why it was scandalous and shocking when defined in terms of its categories, end quote. Into this room, the performers brought different objects found in the war zone, a cart, a decayed wooden board, a scaffold, a decrepit loudspeaker, and a kitchen chair. These poor objects, that is, like the room to which they were brought in, functionless, discarded, and useless. They were wrenched from the war reality and placed in a space where the object's objectness could only be established in its relationship to other objects or people in space. Thus, the object's function was not assigned by a convention which had been compromised by the war condition, but by a performative process outside of the conventional normative artistic and aesthetic categories. The object was empty, quote. It had to justify its being to itself rather than to the surroundings which were foreign to it. In the return of Odysseus, Penelope, sitting on a chair, performed the act of being seated as the human act happening for the first time." Why confronting us with Penelope sitting in a chair in the 1944 production of The Return of Odysseus, Cantor seemed to suggest that while the war was raging, one needed to abandon the contemplative attitude towards the object, such as the objects of Marshall de Saint-Champ, Dada, Surrealism, in order to become conscious of the state of unrest and the critical constellation in which precisely this fragment of the past finds itself in precisely that moment. The chair, the object in a room destroyed by World War II exploded the epoch out of its reified historical continuity. The event itself was momentous. It was only grasped as living present in bodies and objects which acted and were acted upon 
or engendered and were engendered. In other words, the event, the staging of the return of Odysseus, and the bodies as well as objects shaping it took place in the war reality. However, the event and the bodies as well as the object were not of that reality. Bereft of the pre-assigned identities, these useless objects needed now to name themselves in the act happening in precisely this present, revealing the fissures and cracks in the dominant and vulgar understanding of time and history. A modified version of history whose site is not homogeneous, empty space or time, but time filled by the presence of the now as Benjamin would have it. Let me substantiate this thought with a statement by Adorno, which may help us to think about the work of art not in terms of representation or presentation, but in terms of an autonomous work of art understood as a determinate negation, pointing to specific contradictions between what art claims and what it actually delivers. Art in achieving identity and intelligibility has imposed recognizable structures upon its objects, suppressing their differences and diversity. This is why Adorno doubts both the effectiveness and the legitimacy of agitative or deliberately consciousness-raising art. Yet he does see politically engaged art as a corrective to mainstream art. Under the conditions of late global capitalism, politically most effective art is art which so thoroughly works out its own internal contradictions that the hidden contradictions in society can no longer be ignored. Here is Adorno's statement, quote, the critical relation to tradition as the medium of preservation is not only concerned with the past, but also with the quality of aesthetic production in the present. To the extent it is authentic, this production does not begin cavalierly from scratch, nor does it attempt to outdo one contrived method with another. Rather, it is a determinate negation. In Beckett's plays, the traditional form of the drama is transformed in all respects through parody." End quote. In Beckett's endgame, the traditional form of drama is transformed in all its respects through its inherent structure in which the relationship between ham and cloth cannot be understood or grasped in terms of traditional dramatic structure because, in the most concrete form, it shows nothing. In Cantor's practice, a chair and those other objects brought into performance space vanish from the field of visibility dominated by the recognizable structure only to re-emerge as that something or nothing that can no longer be transformed into consumer goods made abstractly exchangeable or generally understandable. Thus, as evidenced by Cantor, via Benjamin and Adorno, the role of the work of art is no longer to form imaginary or utopian realities, but to actually be modes of thinking and models of action within the existing real. The focus of the operation is not the way reality is experienced, but the exploration of the mediality of historical reality. If such a possibility is tangible, even though, as it may be argued, um, their spatial arrangement involves the presentation of semblances, of images of action, ideas and institutions, Cantor might have escaped the trap of the Adorian concept of the appearance of freedom, which enchants pseudo-reality and actionism that aggravate themselves for the sake of their own publicity without admitting to themselves to what extent they serve as a substitute satisfaction, elevating itself into an end in itself. He did so by establishing a different trajectory of thinking about art, which presents a challenge to both social networks as well as to ontologies of the present. This materiality and the situatedness of thought 
do not offer an examination of the flaws or imperfections or a set of criticism designed to make the system better, but make us uncomfortable by exposing what the sources of the values are, how they have come into being, what relationships they have constituted, what power they have secured. The materialism of the encounter with the objects from the return of Odysseus compels us to envision a new mode of being, a kind of spatial dialectics confronting not what the objects could be, but the inadequation between objects and those aspects of objects which reality glosses over in order to assign present intelligibility to them. This spatial dialectics, which must, must not be reduced to a logic or a purely formal mental space or the intimated in the production of space wherein uh, Henri Lefebvre calls for a reconstruction of the dialectics along spatial lines, lines unlike Frederick Jameson's, does not refer to a remote idea of utopia in time. This spatial dialectics has little to do with imagining new languages and figurations in physics, bioscience, an alternative world, contiguous with ours but without any connection of access to it. This spatial dialectics as materialism of the encounter between representation of space and representational spaces in the, Odysseus, the return of Odysseus show teaches us how to inhabit the world in a way not imaginary or utopian, but be ways of living uh, and models of practice within the existing real. Unlike dialectics based on analysis of historical time and of temporality, spatial dialectics focuses on the contradictions which imply and explain contradictions in historical time without being reducible to them. In other words, the notion of contradiction is not restricted to temporality or historicity, but draws attention to contradictions and conflicts in space as well as contradictions of space. To Penelope sitting on a kitchen chair in the 1944 production of The Return of Odysseus, which can be viewed as examples of social and spatial interstices disclosing other possibilities differential in character than those in effect within the system. In 1947, Cantor wrote, quote, while I was in Warsaw, I saw a piece of an iron bridge which must have been hit by a bomb. I was struck by the sight of this incredible compression. I had a shocking sensation of the force which had done it, unimaginable as a human force. A thought crossed my mind that if someone, a joker, placed this piece of an iron as a monument, as a monument on a public square, in the future, the historians would, in its entangled form, decipher the forces which governed our time. The piece of an iron bridge, which was destroyed by the war, not only heralded the post-war artistic convention, but also, as chronicled by Cantor, was like a punctum, a material sign for the changing conditions. On the one hand, the piece of an iron bridge was a concrete reminder of the recent war events and of the forces that had destroyed it. On the other hand, this piece of a useless iron bridge, as the return of Odysseus made clear, could resonate with the material conditions and forces governing Cantor's time. Some 60 years later, in The Emancipated Spectator, Rancière describes a photograph taken by French artist Sophie Rist-Huber. In the photograph, a pile of stones is harmoniously integrated into an idyllic landscape of hills covered with olive trees. Like the other photographs in the series, WB, West Bank 2004, it represents Israeli roadblock on a Palestinian road. The emblem of war imprints cards on the territory. For those who wish to engage with it, it unravels contradictions in space and contradictions of space and the forces which governed our time. The image in the state of unrest 
changes our gaze and the landscape of the possible because it is not anticipated by its meaning and that, that does not anticipate its effects. Thus, to return to the questions posed at the beginning of this essay, the works discussed here are the inscriptions on the unresolved contradictions between the aesthetic promise of the object located in, but being not of, that reality and the realities of oppressions in the world. It is only this trope of spatial dialectics which it is only this trope of spatial dialectics of unresolved contradictions, a kind of the state of unrest, which carries with it, with it arts and life's emancipation on the condition that their meaning, image, and effect are not anticipated. Thank you. Should I just speak, try to speak? Yeah. Maybe I'll just try to speak louder. position to be the last speaker for this symposium and privileged in the sense that I got a chance to benefit from all of the conversations happening in the room for the past two days um, and all the papers that were presented. So I went home last night trying to write a conclusion for my presentation. Instead I wrote an introduction with 
um, that was a partially a dialogue for me with some of the ideas that have been presented in, in the space. So um, my presentation today is called uh, Universality from the Margins, Performing the Explicit Body in, Bel in the Belarus Free Theater's Trash Cuisine. And this is part of the larger dissertation project for me on Belarusian theater practice since 1991. Um, the, what I'm going to be talking about today um, is actually is one production, uh, Trash Cuisine, uh, by one company, the Belarus Free Theater, who I will also frequently be referring to as the BFT. So BFT, Belarus Free Theater, same thing. It's just easier to say BFT sometimes. Um, and this production happened at the Young Vic Theater in London. Um, and so first I wanted to say, why, why is the Belarus Free Theater important? Well, it's important, they're an important company because they are hands down the most well-known theater company um, in Western Europe, in the US, and in the UK. And in some of these circles particularly, this might be the only Belarusian, this company might be the only Belarusian kind of cultural product that people will see. And that's definitely true among some of my colleagues in the US. Who, um, for Bel the Belarus Free Theater is their Bel <laughs> Belarusian uh, cultural product. Um, and this company, they gained their notoriety as a human rights theater company, which is important. Um, in 2007, they won the French Republic's uh, In Defense of Human Rights Prize. Um, they were the only company, as I know, as far as I know, to receive a prize, which usually is given out to uh, like NGOs and activists and such. Um, in my field, in the field of theater and dance, um, where there's kind of a new, new interest in scholarship at the intersection of human rights and theater, um, they were included as a case study in this survey book called Human Rights and Theater. Um, and particularly, maybe most interestingly for this presentation, um, a few, I have an anecdote, a few months before I went to do my research um, in the UK on this project, there was a presentation by an ex-political uh, um, candidate um, for presidency in Belarus. His name is Andrei Sanukov. He came here. He was invited by the political science department. I don't know if anyone else had a chance to see him. And uh, I knew that Sanikov and the co-founders of the BFT, Natalia and Nikolai, who I will mention, were friends. They were family friends. Uh, and I went up to him and I asked him about the, the, the BFT and I somewhat innocently called them a political theater company and he corrected me. He said, no, 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 they're not a political theater company. Um, I would say they are a human rights theater company. And I have been struggling, I mean, I have been processing that distinction since then, and I went into the research with this in mind, and so with that distinction that he's trying to make, I wanted to propose, I guess, kind of two frameworks for my presentation today. Um, the first is that when I'm talking about human rights, I'm not necessarily talking about a set of like constitutional values or inherent principles that are human rights, um, although it is obviously that. I'm talking about human rights as a mode of production. Which is to say that the Belarus Free Theater can absolutely be seen as a political theater. When they started off working um, in Minsk when they were in 2005, that's when the company was founded, they were addressing issues that they thought were taboo in Belarus. Um, issues like mental health, suicide, um, LGBTQ rights, women's issues, and so forth. Uh, um, and they can also be considered political in the way that they function in Belarus. They are not officially registered as a theater company there. Uh, probably because uh, they, the two co-founders are, are really involved in, those dissident, in the dissident movements um, within the country. Um, and yet they are a human rights company according to Sinikov. And so what I'm, I'm proposing is that this company is made into human rights. And it's made into human rights once it circulates through international instruments of human rights. Things like um, human rights theater festivals, uh, human rights watch film festival, which they are a part of. Um, they are sponsored by Amnesty International um, and Index for, Index for Censorship in the UK. Um, so this is, this, what, this is the transaction that I think Sanikov is speaking about. And he's translating a kind of, um, something happens when they move into, into this different circle. They gain some kind of new symbolic value and certainly they have become this kind of human rights company that is not important just in the sense of Belarus, but really um, included in, like I said, uh, kind of a, it's like the standard company that you think of when you think of as human rights, if you think of human rights. Um, so that's my first point. And the second point that I wanted to make, oh, the second question that I'm asking has to do with the relationship between universality and that question mark um, in my title. 
And I think this relates a little bit to Alejandro, what you were mentioning yesterday when you were speaking about, in the, in the context of the Holocaust, about potentially the Holocaust becoming, becoming a kind of memory paradigm that others can latch onto. Um, I found that very useful, and I thought maybe to rephrase that thinking in this, for this particular context and to ask the question, how does the Belarus Free Theater present or perform a kind of human rights paradigm that allows them, A, to latch on to other times and spaces, and you will see this as I go forward, and also allows others to latch on to them. And this will also become a little bit clear as the presentation moves forward. Um, so those are the two points I wanted to bring up. So framing. Um, so Trash Cuisine. Trash Cuisine is a piece that addresses uh, uh, capital punishment and other forms of state enforced violence. And the company um, is doing this not only by telling the story of Belarus, but putting the story of Belarus in relationship to other uh, capital punishment, uh, state enforced violence stories um, from different times and places, Argentina, Rwanda, uh, the US and the UK are also included and so forth. Um, so in this presentation, I'm gonna be looking at the artistic practices um, that are used to forge this connectivity between these very different times and places. Um, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna argue that what they are doing is using the explicit body, what I'm gonna refer to as the explicit body, as a universalizing tool in order to depart from a practice of human rights rooted in identification to one rooted in sensation. Um, and I'll make two arguments about that. The first is the reason that they do this is that they want to disidentify from a particularly uh, nation state, nation state political war. I'll become clear. Um, that's the first argument. And then the second thing that I will look at is how disidentifying from the nation state political border is also reinforcing the political border as the paradigm of human rights here. And as a consequence, um, masking, making invisible, not really dealing with other forms of cultural historical <coughs> in the space, such as race and language, which I will be addressing. So, I think from here I will start to look a little bit. The Young Vic Theater is located on a trendy street called The Cut on the South Bank of London, across the bridge from St. Paul's Cathedral and a 10 minute walk from the Globe Theater, the Tate Modern Museum, and Europe's tallest Ferris wheel, the London Eye. On an early summer day in 2013, I arrive at the theater to watch the BFT's newest show called Trash Cuisine. The performance is part of the summer festival series called Lift, whose mission is to, quote, bring global stories to London, transforming the city into a stage, and celebrating the experiences of the many individuals, cultures, and communities that call London their home, end quote. The BFT seems to be a perfect fit for the performance of the global city. They are a newly minted UK theater company that relocated to London from Belarus in 2010 after four members of the troupe were granted political asylum. These members were publicly involved in the campaigns of the political opposition in Belarus. And in the aftermath of the December 2010 re-election, Alexander Lukashenko fled the country as exiles. I head upstairs past a crowd of young, attractive customers eating and drinking in the cafe spaces and past the main stage theater doors to the black box theater nearby where the BFT is showing their production. The usher hands me a simple two-page program and a postcard to sign. The postcard reads, fuck real politic, or real politic, on one side, and on the other side is a note asking for increased economic and political sanctions against Belarus addressed to the president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz. The letters in Fuck Real Politik are spelled out in naked images of human bodies, and the writing on the back demands that the Belarusian administration return bodies of executed individuals and abolish the death penalty in Belarus. Later that evening, at a reception that follows, I will see a placard on the wall that explains the stakes of real politic for the company. And so here, I'm not gonna read you everything, but basically what, what it says, the definition of real politic is a pragmatic form of diplomacy associated with the relentless pursuit of national interests and disregard for ethical considerations. It would seem then that the postcard draws a connection between real politic and the naked bodies, 
to demonstrate the violence inflicted on bodies when the nation state is underwritten by economic and political imperatives between Belarus and other countries. And here I would just add that this, this, in this little placard, there's an anecdote about Lukashenko meeting with the Lithuanian uh, president and they're signing a trade agreement, which outrages the BFT, um, who want to draw attention to the human rights uh, kind of human rights issues in the country and the naked body. So that's the juxtaposition um, that is happening here. And this is an image actually from that. There's an art exhibition alongside the show that is um, featuring these photographs. I find a spot. I find a spot in the first row of the auditorium and watch the production. Trash cuisine is structured around the issue of capital punishment and state enforced violence and is presented through a series of vignettes or dishes that relates stories of harrowing physical and emotional violences from places around the world and across historical time. The production marks a significant departure for the company's prior works. It is the BFT's first production since their exile that features an international cast, um, i.e. A, a combination of Belarusian actors and UK, US, Australian actors from different ethnic and racial backgrounds. It also expands the scope of their concern for human rights beyond the border of Belarus uh, to a state to stage a transnational and transtemporal human rights alliance that presents on stage such, such distinct times and spaces as Rwanda's genocide, a recent case of capital punishment in Belarus, Great Britain's capital punishment cases in the 70s in relation to the IRA insurgencies, and Argentina's dirty war in the 70s and 80s. In other words, it would seem that within the span of two years since the company's exile, the company had gone global. They were not only bringing the particular flavor of oppression in Belarus to cosmopolitan audiences in London, but they were constructing a global schema themselves. I take note of the model of global inclusivity in trash cuisine from an aesthetic standpoint. The production proposes to move across state borders by pointing to the bodily excess or trash disposed of by the state. In the production on stage, as in the postcard image, the body, stripped and naked, becomes the aesthetic site through which human rights connect connectivity is forged and represented. The body, as material form through sensations of smell, sound, taste, and touch, is intended to exceed forms of signification and identification associated with the nation state. For example, um, in a scene about the Rwanda genocide, an actress balances on a plank while another actor cooks uh, red meat on an active stove nearby. And the burning meat smells up the auditorium and the actress is like physically in real strain because she's holding a position uh, she's holding that position for, I don't know, like the whole scene, maybe 10 minutes. <laughs> um, maybe five minutes, actually. Um, and so it's repulsive and straining, but not in an illustrative fashion, right? In general, the food and the bodies in the piece are less symbolic in function and far more sensorial. Um, the production does not use them to serve as historical cultural markers, but instead as a materiality for relations. So uh, the food here, like we'll oftentimes, uh, um, you know, be used to hit, hit certain actors. Um, there's one scene where there's a, a spicy red pepper in the, in, in the, on stage and this actress in front of me is starting to cry. Um, and so, and there's also one scene, for example, where there's, uh, he's playing a man who's been in jail, like a, a prisoner for a long time who's handed a meal and he's looking at this spoon as if he's never seen a spoon before. Um, so he, participating in, in, in thinking about this spoon as something, um, kind of materiality that's foreign to him and not necessarily the marker of what a spoon should do. Um, uh, and then in the last scene of the play, the actors proceed to chop up onions right in front of the audience. And I'm sitting in the first row and start to cry because the acid or the, the sweat of the onion irritates my eyes. And so as an audience member, I am provoked to consider the visceral physical aspects of bodily contact rather than an empathetic response engendered by symbolic representation in narrative or story form. I mean, yeah, so this is, this is what I mean by the, empath the, the empathetic response. The, the empathetic response is not from a certain recognition or uh, a certain identification I might have with the story, but literally I am crying because it hurts. <laughs> so I leave the theater pondering. What exactly does the body, naked, stripped, or otherwise, register and not register about human rights? 
what is at stake in this mode of universality for the BFT? And this ethnographic segment, segment that traces the trajectory of B the BFT, their exile, and their new global turn onto the stage of the Young Vic Theater, um, I would like to use this as a starting point to make two arguments. First, that the sensorial, the sensorial body in trash cuisine should be understood in relationship to, BF, to the BFT's exilic situation in London. The BFT staging of the explicit body is intended to produce a dis disidentification with the political border of the nation state, and thus with the discursive incarceration of the BFT as a marginal company from the fringe of Europe, only allowed to speak to, uh, to um, a political oppression in Belarus. And as described in the postcard, this nation state border is also one that compartmentalizes national politics rather than addresses transnational contingencies. And so the second point that I would like to make is I would like to argue that there is also a very important limit to the use of such a body as a universal human rights imaginary in trash cuisine. And by framing the universal in terms of state-enforced violence, in other words, that what they are transcending is essentially a political board of difference that is specific to governments and regimes, this body ultimately masks and averts, averts attention from other forms of social relations between bodies that are historically and culturally produced. The day after I saw the production, the co-founders of the BFT, Nikolai and Natalia, told me during an interview that Trash Cuisine had received a one-star review from, this, from a, a newspaper called City AM. And City AM is an almost tabloidish newspaper, they say, but it's still widely read during morning commutes in London. Natalia mentions that the review ends with the line, now go away, and that it is, quote, this is her saying, not quite racism, but that everywhere in the review it mentions work on your Belarus, end quote. The duo continues to describe their main hardship working in the UK as one where they are commanded to perform only Belarusian subject matter. And Nikolai adds, quote, UK theater can do can work on any UK theater can work on any topic, but for Belarusians, only their topic. End quote. And Natalia expresses her concern that audiences in the UK do not even let the company touch Shakespeare. They use Shakespeare in trash cuisine, but that's important. Um, these critiques register the way that the BFT has become discursively incarcerated within the particular of Belarus, while the theaters at the center of Europe are free to appropriate any material they like around the globe. And trash cuisine, and from this perspective, should be understood as a desire for universality by disassociating from the very identity that had catapulted the company to inter international fame in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, this identity has also commanded them to perform the marginal position within the global city, even as they are under understandably hesitant to call their particular form of discrimination racism. Um, and I should also add here that the Belarus Free Theater is the, the, the the Belarus Free Theater is how they are known abroad. In Belarus, they are called just the Free Theater, so that national uh, marker is, is not, not, not part of the, the game in, within Belarus itself. Um, so under, in other words, what is being underscored here is actually a paradox of the body and human rights practice. Um, the body as a marker of an oppositional national identity is both necessary for the company to make human rights claims and to mobilize resources, and yet it, is also, it also forms a structure of belonging through which anti-immigration sentiments arise by virtue of an inclusion-exclusion dynamic. And here I just wanted to mention uh, briefly uh, in relation to some of the conversations uh, yesterday where uh, Lars, Lars particularly was talking about the moral, the victim, the victim status and how that has become a kind of moral surplus, there's a currency to it. And I think here what, we're, what I'm trying to point to is actually also the costs of the victim status. In other words, this company, certainly mobilized by by being a kind of victim and presenting political violence stories of Belarus and they get a certain traction from it. But here we also see that the, the, the kind of, the other move of it is that they are actually not able to really ever be universal, ever be really the global. Um, and in turn, from an aesthetic, artistic standpoint, they don't get to be the world-class artists they want to be. They get to be, they're only the human rights kind of marginal artists. And this is what concerns them a lot. And that can be one way of thinking about the costs of the human rights paradigm. And so this is where the explicit body enters. And I want to just briefly say that I'm using a term in my field in performance studies coined by a woman named Rebecca Schneider to talk about the explicit body. And for her, the explicit body is about the unpeeling or um, 
revealing of the process of signification. So not necessarily that one would get to an original, essential kind of humanness in the body, but actually that one reveals that kind of the sedimentation of, of signification or identity itself. So I find it obviously useful here, although she writes about a very different context. So. Um, in trash cuisine, the explication of the body is essentially a stripping of political signification within the nation state in order to resonate on the level of universality. The explicit body appeals to a supranational, supranational, or transnational alliance of near human bodies that are violated by the state. For example, in one scene where Pavel, who's a Belarusian white male, and Esther, a black English woman, dance the tango together about Argentina's genocide, it's difficult to read their dance through the lens of national character. Their bodies do not represent Argentina, and they do not even dance the tango well. Mm -hmm. The segment is not intended to provide the segment is not intended to provide knowledge of Argentina, but to wrench it from a national identity. Specifically, the writing of the nation state here in this pair, in this in this performance um, is important only to the extent that it presents a fa facade. Um, that covers up the performance that matters most, the dancing, sensing bodies being exterminated by the state. And so this is the universalizing thing that I'm seeing, that here it's any state, any state where the political kind of imperative overrides ethical concerns is the organizing idea of this production. So Esther and Pavel remind us of the bodies and not about Argentina. The explicit body then becomes the site of the human rights claim which constitutes the ethical need to think and act transnationally in the face of a real politique that uses the nation state as a container of knowledge to separate different times and spaces instead of pointing to their contingencies. And yet, it seems imperative to ask, who has the right to author the explicit body and representation? And more to the point, who determines the explication of the body, who and what it means, or what and how it means? After Natalia and Nikolai described to me their anger with the City AM review and the anti-immigration sentiments that it fueled, I asked them another question. Why did they choose to stage global stories and how did they imagine they related to places such as Rwanda and Argentina? And Natalia answers me by describing a phone call she had that morning with the theater troupe from Palestine that was interested in knowing more about how the BFT achieved international visibility for their political struggle. And Natalia ends the anecdote by saying, quote, in our situation, it's simple. We are the same as them, end quote. And I want to be clear here when she says we are the same as them. I'm also, I had also just proposed to her, I told her that, um, you know, I, I would imagine that a UK theater company would have to tread, tread very carefully around kind of like a global human rights kind of represent, representational practice, considering a colonial history where, you know, so-called universal values are quite oppressive for certain peoples. Um, so when she says we are the same as them, she's actually saying no. We are. I am. We are not like a mainstream UK company. Um, what what is what she means then when she says um, when she says this is that both the Palestinian theatre company and the BFT are looking for visibility in the international sphere in order to draw attention to their political struggle, and so therefore the sameness that she refers to underscores an imaginary link between Belarus and Palestine that is essentially really about a shared character of resistance against state violence. Doesn't matter if we're talking about Lukashenko or we're talking about the Israeli state. And also what authorizes the BFT to stage these global stories, rather than let's say this mainstream UK theater company, hypothetical, is that they too participate in the struggle against state violence. In other words, they have struggle credentials that they can point to. But what the call of sameness and its staging through the explicit body masks are forms of bodily signification and meaning not reducible to political opposition. In foregrounding political violence, one of the social relations never engaged in the production is that of racial difference, as Pavel and Esther from that tango sequence dance in supposed sameness. Um, so the production stages, you can see this, uh, a post-racial imagination. As such, the paradigm of the nation state is actually reinforced as the dominant paradigm of human rights practice in this production. The cosmopolitan audience that screens the play never needs to confront bodily relations of identity, not about political opposition or state violence. The production renders cultural historical specificity unimportant in favor of acknowledging a political difference in government structures. And importantly, for the BFT itself, even this cultural, historical difference of the nation of Belarus, not the state of Belarus, 
is not transcendable through the explicit body. What becomes quite noticeable throughout Trash Cuisine is that the bodies that speak on stage are those of the non-Belarusian actors for whom English is a native language. And on stage, the Belarusian actors are completely new, not a single word. So as it turns out, going global is only for those that have access to the legitimate universal language in the space of the young thing. Um, and here I just want to briefly mention a moment where offstage, and I don't write about this, Aliyev, who's the oldest of the, the Belarus free theater actors, speaks no English. He's trying to get a, a glass of wine from the, wait the British waitress, and he has no way of communicating to, to her. And so he starts to do this very strange clown, buffoonery, atrophy, like da 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 da. And I'm standing next to him, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, um, there's a real kind of a a real kind of disjuncture between what is, you know, the kind of universal, the utopianism of the stage, and then what happens in terms of who really has access and mobility in, in, in London um, stage. So I think, do I, should I have the, I think that, um, yeah, I think I'll end here. I had some questions that I wanted to pose, but I think that, I think that James will probably come up Chargers, you're here to the very end, um, just a bit left. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes. It's my understanding that this is a pretty grand. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need that up here? This is a pretty transdisciplinary group. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to, I'm going to talk a bit about the broad context for thinking about the relationship between art and rights, so that we can uh, more finely understand the contributions of these papers. And then I'll summarize a couple of takeaway points from these papers as a way of getting us into Q&A. So really broadly speaking, there's two opposed models for thinking about the relationship between art and rights. On the one hand, you have people like Martha Nussbaum, Richard Gordy, Lynn Hunt. And in different ways, they all do the same thing. They all say art promotes human dignity. And specifically, art has contributed to the modern human rights movement. So Nussbaum famously argues that reading novels actually cultivates your humanity and makes you into good global citizens. Richard Rorty at one point famously claimed that all the moral progress, if you think we've made any, all the moral progress we've made in the past couple of centuries, it doesn't come down to, to reason or logic or ethics in philosophy, but just to, as he says it, sad and sentimental stories being told over and over again, expanding the scope of our empathy. And then Lynn Hunt, the historian, she makes a, a slight, slightly more specific claim. She says, the current, the modern human rights movement, as we think about it, and generally, in a classical sense, we date this back to the French Revolution, where, where it begins to take off. This was only possible because of novels. That the invention of the novel, because the novel was invented, right? It didn't always exist. It was invented, like TV. And it had really broad cultural implications. The invention of the novel shortly before the French Revolution swept across Western Europe and completely changed human empathy as a form. Before this, everyone was distinct and separated by many layers of class and gender, but the novel taught people, Hunt claims, that we all share interior emotions, whether you're a nobleman or a farmer, you all share interior emotions that make you the same. And this was not experienced in the mind, but it was experienced in the body. And so novels changed everything, she says. And this made the, uh, the modern human rights movement possible. That's over here. On the other end are those who argue that, in fact, art mostly functions, these are people who work in what you call ideology critique. Art functions maybe mostly, but certainly often, uh, against the promotion of human dignity, as a substitute for the promotion of human dignity. So the stories we tell are status quoist, right? They, they promote empathy, but empathy doesn't cause you to do anything. Mm -hmm. Empathy, in fact, does the opposite. Empathy, if you hear a sad story, it doesn't make you want to go out and intervene. It, it lets you off the hook, because you can say to yourself, I've done the work of being sad for those people. I'm OK. I'm good. And, and then you can step back. Or it promotes a kind of human rights 
born, like the voyeurism of others' suffering, which is also essentially status quoist. Uh, and, so, and so art does not promote dignity and rights. One of the most interesting case studies I think about is the US abolitionist movement, since I come from that, that tradition of study. And on the one hand, there are those who say, art did everything there, right? Like Uncle Tom's Cabin, the book, caused it all. Abolitionism was a marginal outlier movement and overnight became the center of culture because of this book. And that changed everything. And, and abolitionism took off and the Civil War happened and it's all good because of what art did. And on the other hand, there are those who say, in fact, it's the opposite. That the economic system was working slavery out of its body, so to speak, because feudalism just didn't work anymore in capitalism. So the economic system was working slavery out of its body. And what the literature of abolitionism did was reconfigure racism to survive post-slavery, to create new, more subtle forms of racial domination so you could keep white supremacy um, and have it work, but not have it rely upon the system of slave domination uh, that existed. So art was, in fact, abolitionism was, in fact, uh, the enemy to make progress. So you have these two models. Uh, and and these, these, these papers are, are fascinating and subtle in, in the way they work, I think, between both and do two different kinds of things. So, Here's my takeaway points. They're very complex and subtle papers. I'll, I'll toss out a couple ideas and then leave it to you for Q&A. So, so I'll start with Rita. In fact, I think they're both doing something very similar. They're both, they both take two theatrical productions, but they do it to show the power of art to decontextualize. That decontextualization is the key to what art can give us. So Rita's talking about how sensation, like relating to each other not as minds or ideas or categories, but as actual just bodies or pre-cognitive bodies, that this can decontextualize us and expand the scope of our empathy. So when you're at the theater, you're not looking and saying, oh, Belarus citizen or political activist or whatever narrative, whatever narrative frame you have for understanding people, those are sort of prisms that get in the way of an authentic relationship with some categories that define them in advance of knowing them, so you don't get to know them. So by, by getting us to relate as bodies, like crying bodies, as you say, all that's gone. And they're liberated from the restriction of those defining categories. And you have this expanded scope of empathy and connection, which is sort of what human rights is about. And so on the one hand, I think she's saying, good. Um, but on the other hand, she's pointing out quite deftly, and, and I think with that question you asked, devastatingly, is it this form of universalization, even though it's universalization from the margins, even though it's universalization from below, or however you want to talk about it, it's still universalizing and has the same problems of universalizing. So in this case, what it does is it allows them to think, well, we're just like the Palestinians, or perhaps we're just like the Rwandans, because we're all resistors, or we're all something, we're all human, we're all bodies. And that participates in one of the most devastating blindnesses that have defined culture in the past couple hundred years, this idea that um, we can, that race doesn't matter, right? That we're in a, uh, we, in positions of power, don't have to pay attention to race because it's all post-racial. Um, and this allows the, the perpetuation of, of very, very powerful systems of domination. So I feel like both are going on and, and it's a really subtle analysis of those. Um, Mikhail is doing something similar with the return of Odysseus and and I feel like you were, you were pointing to two, two problems with how we think about art. On the one hand, there's art that is future looking, that's sort of revolutionary, you used the phrase of formative utopia, I think. Art that's, that sort of promises if we can get into this space of imagining this utopia, we're gonna get to a better place, and art can do this, art can participate in this. And that's a kind of false promise. It's a, it, it, it becomes a substitute for, an act, for action because it enchants you with this possibility that is never going to be, and, and it fails. On the other hand, there's sort of backward looking stuff, and human rights was the uh, narrative to define this, that looks to the past catastrophe, things that have happened that we're going to redress and address. And that's a problem because it is also status quo. So it doesn't ask us to change anything, it just says, let's fix the past make the system just tolerable enough so that you can keep going. So that no change, no revolutionary change is required. And so whether you look forward or backward, we have the same problem, no change is possible, 
and the world will be drastically need change. And so what, what he was doing with Return of Odysseus, I think, is, is showing decontextualization as a power, but this time decontextualizing objects. So, I mean, something as simple as a table or a chair, right? Like tables and chairs are like humans and actors. We relate to them through all kinds of categories of prisms of perception. So a table is an Ikea table, and that comes with all kinds of assumptions and understandings of yourself as like a global shopper or a consumer, and that's a, that's a role that defines how you act in the world. And so if you can get into a space, and this art production does and did or, or offers that possibility, where even the most basic objects of daily living are decontextualized, so you're no longer coming to them with these predefined categories of understanding, it can take you out of your own trap role, your own trap role of perpetually seeing yourself as a commodity shopper in the global exchange of capital, for instance, and in that way, open up possibility for some kind of change, um, some kind of mode of thinking change. So I, I feel like that's a couple points I took away. Obviously, there's a whole lot more going on in those papers than just those two things. Um, and and we, we have so little time for q and I I kind of want to give you guys the chance, rather than have me toss out the icebreaker. But if you need an icebreaker, I can do an icebreaker. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be quiet. Oh, good. Thank you both for extraordinary pieces. Uh, I was thinking about this in terms of your paper and about what I think maybe you don't have this as well. Um, so, there's something, but the question where, how, and on whom do uh, objects, uh, autonomous works of art, the decontextualized objects, and what is the word that they do? Um, I, maybe I will just change one, one word. Uh, the word would be decontextualizing. I think that there is something else that's going on in at least what I'm proposing in the work of, of, of counters. And I think that uh, to go back to the question that Joachim asked me during the break, neither Cantor nor Adorno claim that cynicism is the only mode of operation. And I think that in precisely in, or, in order to get out of the binary that you had so eloquently expressed, less. What is significant about the work of some of these artists is reintroducing the notion of dialectics and historical materialism. So it is not a representation the way Aristotle would define it in physics, right? Paragraph 192a that it's a mirror held up to nature. Or Plato in Timaeus, where he talks about one that becomes two, which is always a transfer from subject to object. But it is always a dialectical relationship in which you don't have subjects and objects, you have elements folding back upon themselves in order to reveal the contradictions existing within them in that moment of the encounter. The reason I am talking about the return of Odysseus is what was so incredible about this particular production is that it's a double move. The return of Odysseus is not staged in a theater building. Right? And Odysseus, the stage of the return of Odysseus is staged in a place where any artistic activity is punished by the act of death by the Nazis. So, as Adorno says in Commitment, this is an uncompromising, radical move that refuses to play along with the situation that, to a certain extent, accepts one way or the other the idea of genocide or the idea of so Cantor uses something 
that already is a damp, it's garbage. It's a, something that is destroyed by reality, a room. Not a theater which operates according to certain conventions, but something that had been destroyed by that very civilization. Right? Whether the Nazis or not, it doesn't matter. It's still destroyed by our civilization. Right? So in this useless room, there is a moment precisely of disclosing the contradictions that exist when you bring into that space the objects which are basically also useless. Think about human body vis-a-vis -vis -vis Nazis and concentration camps. I mean, Auschwitz is what, 40 kilometers away from Krakow, right? Or less? Huh? And so you bring that human and you bring also that object, both of which are defined by various different conventions, gender, race, etc., etc. So in that way, it's not necessarily decontextualizing only, but there is a double move that's taking place, and that is they all establish their identity in the process of the relationship within that space that is no longer at this moment useful. So as he says, when Penelope is sitting on a kitchen chair, the act of being seated is happening as if for the first time. But it's also Penelope on the return of Odysseus <coughs> and there's that stuff is absolutely lame. Correct, except that for him that return of Odysseus, who is the person who is coming, he says you know, in one of the essays, he says, I couldn't stage the play by Wyspiański, a Polish you know, modernist playwright. You know, for him, the Odysseus is the, is the German soldier coming from the siege of Stalin. Right? And so what happens, it's, it's, it's this, this moment of confrontation of various different elements. And, you know, so how do you disclose precisely that folding back upon itself of the of the element. So what I'm proposing just to finish is what intrigues me is precisely this this notion that you know Adorno places in front of us and that is determinate negation, right? Which in the moment of the encounter you have what Adorno calls an inadequation between what the object is in terms of defined by society by a group. And what had been erased, eradicated from its view, by in order for it to maintain, uh, have certain intelligibility. And for me, this is an extremely uh, passionate <laughs> way of addressing that binary that you are talking about. Because otherwise, do you want to know? I mean, you know, there is a, there is not much right, about cynicism. We are avoiding cynicism precisely through this process of continuous. Determinate negation. So dialectics for me in art. So it's that's why I'm saying it's not Aristotelian representation that you know we all quote. It's not Platonic representation, but it's what I refer to as spatial dialectics. Yes, I have a question, and maybe it helps relate your presentations to what we have been discussing. Uh, the, the recently published book by uh, Nathan Snyder. And then your levy entitled um, Human Right Memory and Human Rights. The basic conclusion is that all advances in human rights movements grow out of collective remembrance of grave human rights violations. Uh, at this conference, it was very sadly diagnosed that the memory of grave human rights violations is not faring very well in many. Central East European countries. My question would be, just does your philosophy of art that you presented teach us lessons about the role that art could play in awakening a kind of collective memory of human rights violations that could contribute to human rights movements and progress on the human rights agenda? I would say yes, and I, I want also Rita to talk about it. I spent a lot of time writing about this, about memory, and how, how there is a very particular understanding of memory as opposed to, I talk about mnemotechnics, mm -hmm. right? And 
it's extremely complex and Cantor in his productions between 1975 and 1990 explored precisely the issue of memory and history and it's an extremely fantastic and way of exploring it but yes so my quick response to you is, is yes he takes us above the understanding of sociogenetic function of memory as the formation of a particular stable fixed memory whether it's forgotten or not I mean he's relentless I mean his productions are I mean really if, if you really understand what he's doing his radicalism in terms of understanding what memory can do is just it's just overwhelming Resolving the very uh, political nature of these conflicts would be 
understand in order to have a position. So I, I, I don't know where to place myself in the attention. I, I, yeah, I want to hear more. I think you name it very correctly. It's a tension that exists. Uh, I think that the when, when, when the quote that you know that I'm using here from uh, Antonio Vasquez Arroyo is taking us back to the notions that Rancière is discussing, right? and the idea to what extent we are. Um, the, the discourse on the ethical the, the ethical term that happened emptied out to a great extent precisely the idea of uh, grounding that discourse in historical materialism. I would say that this is how I understand both of them. Right? That if you think about various different terms that they are making references to, right? You know, from let's say the linguistic term, the narrative term, you know, then performative term, ethical term, right? Specifically, both Rancière and you know Antonio are very much against what had been introduced with postmodern and understanding of politics. So in that way, it's not necessarily that you have to abandon one for the other, but there is a tension, and uh, they want to bring our understanding and the awareness of precisely what the losses might be by adhering only to a one principle. So once again, for me, it, we go back to the notion of dialectic. And that tension is unavoidable, on the hand. Right? I mean, if you mention, in, you know, for example, the rise of nationalism, you know, in uh, what's this referring to now, Central European countries, I can talk about the rise of nationalism in Poland, and I think that you can address that question eloquently too. Uh, is just becoming overwhelming, right? And that rise of nationalism, to a great extent is, for me, very much connected with form of politics that was initiated in the 1980s. Right? I mean, I've just recently written a paper that deals, you know, this fantastic moment in Polish history between more or less 1983 and, 1980, and 1987 or 1988. So this is the time when of deregulated relationships, it's still the time of solidarity, you know, the church and the uh, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, social, socialist regime, it's still before uh, the free elections, the so-called first free elections, when there is a complete deterritorialization of the concepts. And within that, there is a group which is called the Orange Alternative that begins precisely to explore the tensions that you are describing. Uh, and I do believe that to a great extent this is a way of of approaching it. I, um, I was thinking about one thing when I was writing the paper that sort of relates to what you're saying. Um, in our conversations yesterday, I had the impression, and it was very interesting for me to learn, that I had, that kind of the, the mainstream current conversation in human rights actually tends to be a little bit more rooted in ethnic-based genocides versus what I'm kind of exploring in my paper, which is very much maybe actually a kind of old school specter of the Cold War um, notion, rooting much more in kind of political regimes and the conflict in you know, the world of speech and things like that. And I don't know, I, I, I was thinking about this a lot when I was, yes, yesterday when I was writing the introduction, I was inspired by Professor Hinka, your, your great anecdote the other, like two days ago, where you were talking about the communist, the Canadian, the archive of the Canadian communists how they weren't able to necessarily process Jewish suffering, but political treason, no problem, right? So, uh, and I, I felt like I was actually rehearsing this a little bit in my piece, that, that kind of 
that, that kind of paradigm or that mode. And so in this way, I'm thinking to what extent maybe even Belarus is a kind of unique case in that I don't, you know, when the, the, the company, and I don't, the company never really deals very much. When they deal with ethnic, racial, or uh, ethno-national divides, they, it's, it's very light and it's almost always in this kind of like a fake sense of creating a diversity or multicultural feeling like a, a civil, like a, like a Western civil, civil society sort of feeling, like a imposing notions of a liberal democracy that they would like to see um, actuated in Belarus, rather than necessarily, I think, really engaging with the kind of different, different mode about thinking about rights in that space. So it actually, I think Belarus is a very unique space in that from what I've seen, and obviously I haven't seen everything, but with the Belarus Free Theater, I actually see a kind of different, and it's interesting, because they are so almost old school Cold War-like, you know, kind of dated notion of human rights, it's interesting to think why they are so famous. And they really are, and I, can, I really can fight for this, I think they are maybe the most well-known human rights theater company right now. You know, when you search Google, in the English-speaking world, you know, when you Google and stuff. So that's an interesting thing to think about, and maybe that is also a tension here with what you're, with, with what we're bringing up in terms of different even models of, of human rights imaginaries, and uh, why why would we want, why is the Belarus Free Theater so important, um, considering it seems like we've gone in a different direction in terms of that conversation. So I, I will bring up that point that has been interesting Just a, a small idiosyncratic reaction. I think I think it's really useful to make claims about the human rights movement, but whenever and, and they help us develop models. But whenever I hear them, I sort of think about the folks I know around the world doing human rights, and it seems to me there's no such thing as a human rights movement. Um, and and there are some that are sort of radical and revolutionary um, and forward-looking, and there are some that are sort of um, mainstream and just self-looking ice cream cones and institutional inertia. Um, so so, so I, my, my feeling uh, is this is sort of a, kind of a personal quirk is that when people make claims about what the human rights movement does, I automatically think of like 12 groups I know where they're doing the opposite of that. So, so I'm, a, I'm a bit hesitant to move based on those, based on those generalizations. Okay. So, so can we take one more question or comment? Um, uh, very good to that. I think that may be true that there are very different local relations, but nevertheless, these organizations are highly aware of the human rights discourse and the ways in which they can appeal to it, and that's the materiality of the human rights discourse. That's the materiality of the human rights discourse as it shapes local projects. Well, let me uh, thank you to this panel, to Rita, Michal, and Jim for this uh, group presentation. Response. And I also take, want to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers, or our, our, our guests, and uh, moderators, and respondents, and all the participants. It's been two very intense, but uh, productive, and enriching uh, days. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you.